So uh, one of his background, you know, PhD in, in math, and then he took a little bit of a sidestep and apparently played professional volleyball for a few years. This was something I had no idea until he sent me this. So that's kind of crazy and awesome. Um, so if you also have any volleyball questions, feel free to throw those in the Q&A as well. Um, you know, he started uh, a big data, data science consultancy uh, farm within a, a large group, you know, in three years went from uh, five to 15 people, but he really wasn't loving the consultancy life. So you know, uh, went to a large uh, or a, Be a Belgian energy company and um, led their data transformation, you know, on-prem Microsoft to cloud and open source and, you know, was used as, as a blueprint for other companies um, in the European uh, energy group. And then, you know, in 20, in September of 2019, was brought into DPG Media to lead their data engineering. And he's now also responsible, you know, has continued to, to take on more responsibility. And so he is leading as well their news uh, personalization and the data mesh transformation and, and all that. And, and totally is leading uh, 67 people. And then, um, you know, as, as we mentioned a little bit uh, ago, he also is a father for the third time as of Monday. So congratulations on that. And uh, with that, I'll, I'm going to jump on mute and, and uh, let you take over. If you need anything from me, I'm here. But otherwise, you know, the show is yours. And then we'll, we'll, we'll hit the Q&A after. So this should be fine. You should be seeing the screen. So let's continue from here. So uh, indeed, DPG Media a bit about the company as well, so that you know the background. Uh, DPG Media is mostly a BNA company, so Belgium and the Netherlands. We also have a part in Denmark, yeah, that's set a bit aside uh, from government perspectives. Um, and we're active both in newspapers, magazines, video, uh, with, for example, uh, uh, the, the Flemish Netflix as well, radio. Um, so quite broad range. Um, of, of applications and the ambition of the company is, or, or the mission of the company is to enrich people's life with leading media that inform, inspire and entertain. And, and within there, there's already quite a bunch of, of, of basis uh, to do something with data because if you want to inform them best, you should know and understand your people. Uh, but the same for inspire and entertain. The, the better you know your consumer, the more that you can live up to this to this mission. Uh, to do so, I set a BNA company, a, a Belgian business organization, a Dutch business organization, and a, a centrally placed IT, which has the mission to build platforms that are reusable for both Belgium and the Netherlands. And um, I'll be talking about the data mesh. We have one big advantage. Um, we have our IT organization um, divided into domain-driven teams of people working on, on, on a platform that really solves a business question. Um, and, and actually those teams, we, we call them an area. Um, because I'll be using the word later on as well. So if you look to the digital products we have, in, in total we have over uh, 40 brands. They live on six platforms, um, all solving a specific domain question. So Freemium, for example, is the platform which tries, uh, which hosts the brands that have the ambition to reach as many as possible people. Um, without wanting them to log in or, or stuff like that. Whereas selectives is more for the audience that want to dive a bit deeper where we, uh, the, a, a smaller audience yet um, a higher logged in percentage. And those are both newspaper brands. Uh, next to that, we have video and magazines that's more uh, in serving out a specific content um, and then as well, we have, for example, news personalization, which delivers what we call a widget that can be placed within the, the original platform. So you have a, a personalized environment in one of the freemium brands, um, as well as it will deliver a, a product itself as well, um, but a bit more on that later on. Um, to make sure that those digital products, of course, bring profit to the company, um, from, from the consumer side of things, 
Um, we have areas focusing on digital advertising, uh, how to serve out the correct ad on DPG network, um, because I didn't mention, we also have a part active in online services, as we call them. It's, for example, uh, insurance comparison, pri price comparison pages, energy price comparison pages, stuff like that. Um, and then marketing, making sure that we can offer the, the right content, both on our platforms, as well as in newsletters or, or marketing campaigns as well. Um, and next to that, we also have internal facing applications. So making sure that our journalists can write their content, push it to the platforms, um, that our salespeople can sell advertisements to, uh, to our advertisers, stuff like that. Those are truly um, domain specific teams working on a platform. And then we have a few, which I would call domain agnostic, uh, for example, security, for example, group user management. And I, although we're placed in what we call the customer engagement uh, cluster of teams, I also place their data because data is not really solving a specific um, business domain question. Data should be used everywhere. Data should be used in advertising. Data should be used in marketing. But data should also be used in optimizing, for example, distribution, uh, predicting how many papers we should print, uh, stuff like that. Quickly about me, um, I'm heading both the data team and the news personalization team, as Scott was mentioning, so in total up to 67 people. Um, but as said, for me, data is not really a domain issue, and I truly believe that we should move on to the data mesh principle. That means that I should be responsible for less people as more will be placed in the correct domain uh, and that I have more time for either the newborn or as I most often say, uh, can rest some, somehow in my hangmat. Um, but for now it's, uh, it's that uh, number of people. Um, as a company, we also have a clear answer on why we want to become truly data driven and, and that's really nice. We, we truly have the support from higher management in this as well. It's core to the digital strategy. Um, so, so as said, we have both media platforms as online services where media platforms for the company itself, high volume, low, uh, low income, whereas online services, uh, low volume, but if someone's there, there's a high turnover from, from that consumer. Um, and data is truly in the middle to know on the media platforms, when should we offer someone content that steers someone towards our online services or which advertising should we serve out or which marketing campaign to, to turn in from a consumer to a customer, stuff like that. So data is truly in the center of the digital strategy um, by the team. Next to that, we also have truly data-driven products, quite innovative products, um, where, for example, you see Data Lab, which you should consider as a, a, a local Facebook business manager-like alternative. Uh, so where the advertiser can create his own segment, as in, I, for my campaign, I would like to target all Belgian people from a specific province, which we know from your, um, from your subscription information. But as well, I would like him to be interested in topic A or B, which we know from his reading behavior. So the advertiser himself can create a segment. Uh, same for news personalization, uh, which, we, uh, which is the kiosk product, which is on there, stuff like that. But that's what's happening right now. Um, we're now in, in the time that we're focusing on where should data head. And we, we truly made as a company the decision where currently we are quite consumer data driven. So we, we, we have a focus on our digital strategy and our products. It should go beyond that. So I set the example, which I gave you, predicting how many newspapers to print, um, optimizing logistics, uh, internal process mining use cases. We really want to go beyond the consumer data driven uh, side of things and, and turn the, the entire company in a, in a data driven culture. Um, as said, we have a data team uh, in total 33 data engineers and then also a bunch of tagging and tracking specialists. 
Um, we believe that the mission of those people should be delivering value out of data and not to build and maintain a data platform. Um, there's a bunch of tools on the market which you, which you can some kind of buy as a data platform. Um, offering a data platform somehow should also be, is also solving a business domain question, but the focus of the people should really be on, on delivering value. Um, however, we do not believe in the Swiss knife, one tool that solves all. So I also see the responsibility for my people to tie up multiple components um, preferably managed services as I don't want to have too much maintenance hassle um, and, and making sure that those components work together as, as our uh, data platform for the company. Um, to do so, we end up in, a, in, in what we then call a slender and loosely coupled data landscape, um, mainly focusing on four topics there. It's, it's about our tracking, uh, making sure that we can follow online user behavior, knowing who read what on an individual level. Um, we're currently still quite Google oriented, having Google Tag Manager, having Google Analytics, but as well, we use Snowplow as a data collector um, because it allows us to reuse the data in real time. And I definitely, in my time at the energy supplier, I always said, you should stay away from complexity of real-time data analytics uh, if you don't need it. Uh, the example they had, we want to know when someone is on the price comparison page because they might end their contract. Yes, you do, but you don't want to send to email right now because that's quite creepy. Um, later on, I'll, I'll give some use cases where we do need the latest behavior. So in our case, real-time uh, usage of tracking data is, is one of the core things we need to Next to that, we have a bunch of data engineering tools um, that's mostly on enabling the data savvy people. Uh, then I'm talking about Spark, Scala, Python, on top of Kubernetes, scheduling with Airflow, stuff like that. Um, there we use from a Belgian company uh, a, a quite new product, which is called uh, Datafy. Um, which is a wrapper around Spark, Airflow, and Kubernetes, which offers it as a managed service for us. Um, but later on, I'll talk to it as well. It, it allows us to quite easily create environments for every, what I would call a pot of the data mesh. Probably there's a better word for it as well. And then uh, the data enablement tools, that's more for the, the less data savvy people. Um, so that's uh, low way tools like uh, Click Tableau, Looker, uh, where you can still perform some ETL, but it's, a, it's in a GUI uh, where you can click together your own dashboard. Um, but as well, for example, enabling SQL via DBT, data build tool. Um, so that's the kind of tools we have there. And that the real focus should be on delivering our products, which are currently mostly marketing and B2B. Uh, domain focused, um, which gets combined in what we call the profile service and the profile service you should consider as the, the real time aggregate of uh, people's reading behavior where we keep track of six months reading behavior. Um, and we add as well in real time the latest behavior, but, but more on that a bit later. Um, if you look back to 2020 or, or maybe even before 2019, we were um, we, we were quite separated, decentralized. You should almost say um, we had some kind of a data mess set up, but definitely not from a domain-driven design perspective. We had some Belgium data teams, we had some Dutch data teams doing the same stuff. Um, so it's not that we have that we did have domain data teams, but we had multiple teams. Um, we said first early uh, end of 2019 and then throughout 2020, let's bring them all together and let's work on the standardization before we really focus on, uh, on again, decentralizing it, but with the correct governance. And that's, that's already one of the takeaways. If you have a, a spaghetti architecture right now, then most probably it would work better to centralize, to, to make it a bit more uh, slender before you start decentralizing it again. Um, but what the cool thing is at TPG Media and what convinced me to go work there is that it can really go quite fast. So end of 2019, we've uh, introduced 
what we call our universal data catalog, which is a wrapper around AWS Glue. Why a wrapper around it is because we have multiple AWS environments and Glue, unless if you like, if you use Lake Formation, is is only focusing on one AWS account. Then in March 2020, so only a few months later, we've introduced Datafy, so the the wrapper around Airflow, Spark, and Kubernetes. Um, we switched off to to Airflow environments within a few months, and, and currently it's an old slide. It's not used by 40 people; it's used by 70 people already. Um, within the summer, within within a few weeks, we've uh, phased out NiFi in favor of Scoop for batch ingest. Um, then in the, the probably the, there's a blog post around it as well on how we've put Snowflake into production. Um, so we saw some issues from our point of view in Redshift. We decided let's look to Snowflake, uh, have clear uh, success criteria for proof of concept, put a bunch of people for one week really on the project, um, decided after the week, yes, this is what we want to go. The, the, the longest runtime within the process was the contract negotiation, making sure that we have a good estimate on the usage as well. And then taking it into production took us one day. It's really about placing a bunch of people in a hangout. Um, I actually told them you should definitely have one data source available. You should have it in Snowflake. You should connect one of the reporting tools and you should have a dashboard that you do not leave um, this hangout before this is done. And, and with five to six people within a, a few hours, suddenly it was live. Um, then I also have there a phase out of one of our tech managers. But, but as I said, if you see this happening in one year, it was really right towards the standardization. Um, and end of last year, we said now, now is the time we feel comfortable to, to again go to the decentralization because we have a centralized governed data set and, and we do believe in making sure that we place the, the ownership of data products within the right domain. Um, because indeed, if you, if you saw before 2020, it, it was a spaghetti. This is a simplified version, yet it was a scheduling nightmare. No clear overview of who owned which data, no clear overview of which data was there. Um, so lessons learned we, we have from that time as well is, yes, you need a good catalog or a good overview of which data products are there so that you don't have multiple versions of the same data with the same purpose. Um, yes, you need governance on what is there, on, on making sure that data is interoperable as well, um, and, and only then uh, this decentralization might work. So now 2021, uh, as said, end of 2020, we, we had the feeling we're there, uh, at least within the standardization. And in 2021, we really want to enable all DPG media employees. Um, so as said, not only consumer oriented, all DPG media employees with near real time self-service data access towards data products, really an important word within the data mesh concept produced by teams with high domain knowledge. As I said, uh, think about slide two. There we have the advantage that our IT organization is really grouped in domain specific teams. Uh, so at least within IT, we, we have a good place to, to place the ownership of such data products. Um, the data mesh at DPG Media, as it's early stage, and there's that there's probably quite a lot of fuzz about it, what are for us the guiding principles? So, so what are we focusing on is that every business entity or KPI entity has an, a definition owner. Um, if you at our company ask what is a customer, then probably marketing will tell you something different as advertising, uh, as the journalist itself. And although domain-driven design with ubiquitous language in a bounded context, you should have the place to have some kind of differences within every domain itself. At least the granularity should be considered the same by everyone. Uh, a, a customer is an individual, it's not a household, such stuff. So every business entity should have a definition owner and every data product we build fulfills a purpose 
which can be just describing such a, a, a definition. So for example, we will have a set, this is what we consider as the most important fields about the customer. Um, and that is reusable throughout the organization. So the purpose is mostly having the basis, the basic uh, customer information within one set. Um, but it also can be the purpose, this set is being used for marketing automation purposes. And the ownership, both on the definition as on the technical level, resides within the domain where the purpose belongs. So there should not only become a definition of a uh, uh, customer, the concept of a customer should also have an original domain where it should be placed. If we have that, we decentralize the data capabilities. So as I said, we have a bunch of data engineers probably uh, currently all, um, all, all uh, having me as their boss. Um, we, we should make sure that they get placed both on an organizational level within the, the correct domain and that they get the technology tools to, uh, to make sure that they can as a, as a separate team work on that as well. And we need to lower the technical barrier because currently we have 33 data engineers and every every ETL process is Spark Scala. Um, Belgium and the Netherlands are not that big that we can scale up from currently 33 to 100 data engineers quite, quite easily. But if you open up the boundaries for a SQL, um, for GUI driven uh, development, then probably you can definitely scale the data culture within the company. And although we're decentralizing quite a lot, we centralize data quality and data governance rulings. And there the word rulings is really important. We don't centralize data quality. Every owner of a data product is responsible for its data quality. But the minimal set of measurements you need to take, those rules are, are uh, created centrally. Uh, up until now, that was not the case in, in, in our company. And then we adhere to the DATSYS principles of uh, the data mesh, um, where I've, I've written discoverable and interoperable as most important here. Um, probably all six of them are really important, but those were the two we are struggling with. Um, so we had a bunch of data products residing in the entire organization, yet no one knew they were there. Uh, and if there was a set, it lacked an identifier, so it could not be combined. So those are things we really want to focus on, yet security, uh, addressability, all those stuff as well are, are very important. So where we're heading to is um, indeed having data products placed in the right domain and data products can be built on top of other data products. And then still the ownership should be placed in the correct domain. So here an example. Um, about two of our areas. Marketing has, for example, a set on, on um, uh, Gigia, for example, or identifiers from consumers, but can also have a set about uh, marketing uh, impressions or, or newsletter events, stuff like that. But we have also a bunch of customer information within the customer service area, for example, complaints those products reside in the correct area, but can all be combined together into a new product. And that product, again, should reside within the domain where the purpose belongs. Um, so th th that's really important. Every product has a purpose and has an owner of that purpose, and it should be placed in the, in the correct domain. So that's where we're, we're heading towards. That means that every product indeed should have an owner and, and we see three roles in there. That's mostly the definition or the purpose owner that's some, someone very high within the organization, the one defining what we consider as a customer, the one defining we really want to focus on marketing automation. Um, he as well as the end responsible, so, so the one where you can escalate when something is wrong. And then we have more typical IT roles. Every product should have an IT product owner, the typical product owner. Yet to give an example, um, currently we're building a new subscription system. That is one of the first teams that got as well data engineers within their team to deliver a data product. The IT product owner itself is a, a non-data savvy person. He brings the, the domain knowledge 
hence we also added the technical owner, the, the one that you can address when something is wrong, when a data set has failed to, to compute, stuff like that. So th those are mostly the three roles we see. And then I said we should organize um, to make sure that we can deliver um, all these products. So where in the beginning, everyone was placed within the data area, all data engineers were um, residing under me. Now all areas which have enough demand on data savvy people, think about marketing because they both have interesting sources as with marketing automation, um, they also have an important purpose, a, con a consumer oriented data product. Um, they get their own data engineers, they get placed under their budget, um, they work on their environment, on their AWS account, um, yet there's only governance from, from the data area point of view, both on a technology level as on true data governance rules. Um, and then we also have departments or areas which have a, a lower demand. There we will have a pool of data uh, engineers that, that can be lent out in a system. So for example, distribution uh, wants to predict the number of newspapers we need to print. For a few months, they get uh, resources to build this use case. Um, for that moment, they truly get placed within the distribution team. Um, yet afterwards they return and they'll get lent out to another domain where we try to have people working on quite similar domains so that at least they as well the data engineers as well can benefit from the domain knowledge they get um, it are also those data engineers as they are still centrally managed that are responsible to tie up the platform together um, so to connect Snowflake, DBT, Datafy, stuff like that, um, as we don't have a, a central data infra team, stuff like that. Uh, and, and then one more thing next to the hierarchical organization, I, I'm also responsible or my team is also responsible to place some communities. Um, typical guilds, so bringing data engineers or data scientists or reporting analysts together, share knowledge, share cool use cases. Um, it, it's mostly an in, in inspiration session. Uh, and next to that also data best practices. And that's more, um, we know that certain teams are better in using certain tools. To give an example, we have a team already using long time click. There's another team uh, another department starting to use Click as well. You don't want to let them reinvent the wheel, um, but you should somehow have organized as well that you can lend out the Click expert um, from, for example, the sales department, because normally sales would really claim, this is our dude. We're not going to lend them out to marketing, yet sometimes it really makes sense. And, and then, uh, within the, the data environment, something you already see popping up quite a lot of times, the data stewards and data governance there as well. We will have communities, um, which in the beginning of the data mesh right now will we'll gather quite often, making sure that we have central data quality rulings that people adhere to them. Um, but later on, those will be more to silent um, groups, ones gathering every quarter, for example. The architecture to support this, I've, I've already spoken sometimes about the toolings, but just to have, give you the overview as well. Um, we're an AWS first company, um, so that does not mean we, can, we can't use other clouds, but if there's a, a service um, from AWS, we will use it. So um, for data ingestion, it mostly scoop, scoop or on top of EMR or Kinesis. Um, then for processing, I said Datafy, so the Belgian startup providing us an interface about around Airflow, Spark, Kubernetes. I always tell people, um, it's uh, even I can with one comment line code set up a new Airflow environment now. So that, that's really cool. And it enables us to distribute the, the setup, giving every, um, every pot of the data mesh ownership about their own data environment, although it's centrally managed. And then as well, DBT as a, as a SQL environment where, where 
DPT scripts actually get scheduled by the airflow of, of DataFi. Um, then some of the, the storages we use. Um, and, and then where I, I do believe we, we lack most, it's the, the central data integration layer. So it's the place where you see all the data products, where you see how they are linked, uh, where you see the lineage, uh, where maybe you can even uh, manage centrally the, the data access. There's uh, a set as a, as a data catalog, we had a wrapper around AWS Glue that's not sufficient for our needs. Um, there currently we're looking to, for example, Colibra or Zenea uh, as paid versions um, with a small preference for Colibra as we're a Belgian company and Colibra is a Belgian product uh, or open source alternatives like Amundsen, DataHub, uh, stuff like that. And then to actually use the data um, reporting tools, I, I always tell name one and we have them. We have it, unfortunately. We're trying at least to limit it in the in the first phase to Looker, Click and Tableau, making sure that there as well, from a technology perspective, we have a bit more um, governance. And then regarding data science, it's mostly data IQ and data bricks, but currently as well SAS as we took over a company that was using SAS, but with a clear ambition to phase it out as well. And then one of the use cases we, we well, one I'll, I'll be touching a bit more of the use cases we try to to deliver within this concept as well but the one where we already saw the advantage of uh, of the decentralization is media personalization and as said before we have uh, uh, two video platforms one is advertising paid one is subscription paid um, at least on video personalization is just about fulfilling an expectation it's it's being on par with Netflix, Disney, uh, plus uh, and other platforms like that. Um, but as well, if you look to the media platforms, in total, we have over 40 brands with partners over 100. Um, it's, it's also about fulfilling a hunger. There, there's quite a lot of people that want to read multiple brands for DPG Media. Um, but the more you read, the harder it gets to find everything you're really interested in. Um, so there as well, if we could have a personalization across all brands that we that we own, we can definitely help a certain segment of our user. Um, but then as well, we should be fulfilling an ethics, uh, an ethical role, um, because for video, it's quite okay to to keep presenting the same kind of series. Yet for news, you you want to get people also beyond their filter bubbles. It would be quite easy to keep pushing people to, towards, for example, the political party they tend to read about. Um, but you want to give people also the other point of view on certain topics. Um, so there, as a, as a media company, I, I do believe we have the mission to bring all news and all point of views. And there's also a difference between video recommendation and news recommendation. Um, news content does not get released quite often. Um, people are used to at least create a profile or, or, or at a minimum create a kid's profile uh, and your latest behavior will most likely only consist of one or a few series which, we, which you most likely also watched yesterday or when you started a new one then you, your, your next episode will probably be one of the same series. Um, so as said before, when you don't need the complexity of real time, you can stay away from it. In video recommendation, it's probably quite fine to at least start without real time data, what we actually did. Although there are also advantages in transforming towards real time data, which we will actually be doing. Yet for news recommendation, as news articles get written every few minutes, um, and there's also, at least we see at our brands, a higher likelihood multiple users share a login. Um, it's it's your latest behavior, so the articles you read in your current session that are, are giving quite a lot of information about the new preference informations. So in, in that case, you really need the, the real-time behavior to predict what is coming on and also some kind of real-time system to predict also the latest uh, articles. 
with as well typical collaborative filtering at least will have a cold start problem in in news recommendation uh, because you tend to have too many new articles uh, so there as well you should have something about content understanding in in your solution so if you look to the the solution we have been built um, every color is located in a different domain um, so we have the tracking behavior knowing what people read on all our platforms uh, with a cross brand cross device um, identifier uh, the, the snowplow id replace our central uh, cookie policy then there's subscription information uh, so for example are you male where but definitely also where are you located because for news personalization people tend to want to read the news from their from their local neighborhood as well and uh, as well content information uh, as said there is a cold start problem when using collaborative filtering for news recommendation it's about understanding the text we have automatically extracting location uh, topics being mentioned stuff like that so, so so every color is a different domain yet they build data products on top of each other for example in the in the content set um, and they all get together in what we then call the profile service or the profile domain um, which wasn't well placed in any of the IT organizations we had so which remains within the data area um, so I'm quite happy I still have the coolest data product we have um, and then gets used for multiple use cases as well. So where I was saying in the beginning, the data lab, um, so the, the Facebook business manager like tool is working on top of the same uh, profile service, but as well the media personalization because it tends to have the information of what people have been reading, both previously as now um, in their current session but as well there are end use cases on top of uh, of other data products within this this flow for example the the content enrichment that gets then used as an input for our search engine uh, and where people always say when monetizing data the biggest concern is to get a qualitative data and you have the typical information that people are saying um Typically, you spend 80% of the time on cleaning your data and only 20% of your time on, on doing cool stuff with it. That's definitely true. But also the second part of this sentence is really important. Uh, the biggest concern is to get a qualitative data which reflects your business um, because that truly improves the value of your data set. Where we previously had 33 data engineers trying to understand what has been built by five to 600 IT people for five to 7,000 employees to reach millions of people on a daily basis get now better divided within the organization and it's all 500, 600 IT people and their product owners that can bring the, the domain knowledge within the data products we have and that increases the the quality but it also increases the stability of products um, and and that's my key takeaway um, by placing the ownership within the domain becoming getting them responsible from an sla perspective to deliver their data product truly increases the data stability um, with the domain knowledge it also increases the data quality and to give an example um, a set where um, quite soon launching a, a, a completely personalized product having content from all our brands the step before was a personalized newsletter and then before the a personalized push message that's something we can still play with and, and if you see increasing data quality and we did by for example focusing on our location uh, extractor you also increase the the relevance so the better your data set gets um, both in knowing where people are living as in understanding the location within the content um, we saw the open rate of push messages um, same tech stack just uh, a better understanding of the content going up by five percent so making sure that you have this increased quality by decentralizing uh, only already in this case uh, showed a uh, uh, a true boost to what we have and we see that in multiple products so that being said I, I would like to thank you and ask you whether there are any questions
All right. Uh, thanks so much. I mean, I've got a, a whole list of, of, of questions while people start to, to jump into the Q&A section and stuff. So um, one, one thing that I had was you talked about having 40 brands. You know, how do you map those domains and, and how did you do that? You know, uh, how many domains did you end up having? And, and like when you think about the you talk about IT people, I'm assuming that's also the development team and stuff like that. Um, how many people are, are in a domain typically? And, and you know, I know it, it varies and stuff, but like uh, at your size of, of company, are there a hundred domains or are there five domains or, and, and how do you kind of map those boundaries? Yeah, um, as I said, we have the area model and I'll, I'll go back uh, through, through my slides. Um, so th these are not all. Uh, in total, we have 19 what we call areas, and and those are the the higher domains. So we have five to six hundred people, we divided into 19 areas. Um, yet some of those areas actually have multiple subdomains under it. So the the size we have is more or less i would say 25 to 30 relevant domains yet some are mapped in in uh, multiple uh, teams and and if you look for example on on the brands then it's really focusing on which question do they want to to deliver um do they want to reach a bunch of people do they want to have a high logged in consumption do they offer video content or, or news or media content uh, or magazine content so those are the main differences regarding the brands um, th that means that i believe our smallest area or domain is eight people um, it's not a data heavy uh, domains yet currently they have a project or, so currently they have two data engineers being placed so, so they grow from eight to ten to deliver their first data product um, yet in the end till uh, it's it's project based for them whereas the largest ones and then i won't be talking about group it and group user because that's that's more service desk related that's bigger but the, the larger um areas actually delivering on a certain domain or between 30 and 40 people okay and and you know you also talked about your mapping of you know the different kind of responsibility owners and how that can be under one person or that can be multiple people broken out um i, I really like that that figure that you showed um about how many data products are you seeing per i mean per person or per domain or per, you know, however you think about that, just so you don't end up with an overload. And like, how how big do you think about as a data product? You know, so there are some people that are saying a data product should be a single table. And so one data product owner may own, you know, 40, 50, 60 data products versus collapsing it all. So each domain has one or two data products also feels like it might be too big of, of a, a boundary around that yeah yeah let's let's start with the uh, the second part of the question i don't believe that a data product should be one table uh, a data product should be um a product that is delivering value on a specific topic for for example if you look to reporting purposes we want to have insights on how many people are using our platform but we also want to know a bit about our demographics it's still in a typical star schema so then i believe the star schema itself is the data product and not the fact table nor the dimension are different ones um, same if you look for example to the data vault uh, probably there's you could group multiple uh, elements from the data vault and consider them as as one data product yet have them linked to another part of a data vault stuff like that um, so, so that means that um, it's a bit depending on on the area so for example if you look to marketing um, items supporting marketing questions i i can quite easily think of five to ten data products where probably the definition or purpose owner will be the same person but but as said that's someone high in the organization so it's more the the end responsible who who more has to defend why are we doing something or at one moment in time define 
um, the role and then uh, define the actual definition, what is a customer. Whereas the IT product owner, that's the one that you most likely don't want to overload with too many people, uh, too many products. Um, up to two or three is definitely possible, but I, I, I would say you can't make someone responsible for 10 products and trying to map the vision on where are we heading with this product? What should it support? Um, also, for example, towards source-oriented data products, it's quite often the one, for example, the product owner of the, um, the product owner of, and I have some uh, problems here on my laptop, so that's better. Uh, so the product owner of the subscription system is also response is the product owner of this the set. This is what we consider as subscriptions. Um, so, so so it can map there as well. It's not only the product owner of a data product, but also of an application. Um, and there, I would say, try to limit it to, to a number of data products, which most likely are linked and where you can still set a vision up to three, four. Um, and then the technical owner, it's a bit depending. Um, I, I believe every product needs to have a technical owner, yet we will most likely have multiple products that aren't continuously in development. To give the example of distribution, it's a project, we need to deliver it right now. And the technical owner in the later phase will become also the maintenance responsible because he still knows the application. Um, but that means that if, from a you build it, you run it perspective, you can have as a technical owner quite a lot of backpacks where when you build it quite well, you don't have too much work. Okay, that, that's great. Okay. That, that's fantastic uh, color on all that. It's, it's just such a fascinating kind of setup. So I, I really like that you've got this kind of something, it's the person's day job, something it's their responsibility, but it's not necessarily their day job, but to do once and kind of things. So, uh, we got some, some questions in, in the Q&A. So Austin had asked, um, can you talk about how you validate data as correct before it is published? You know, if you use SLOs, could you give an example? Um, uh, validation, not really because validation is the um, responsibility of the domain itself. So, so um, actually from a central point of view, I do care, but, but that's more from a personal point of view, whether information is correctly responding to this is what we consider as a customer. But I don't care as in, in, in the principle if they have... Uh, certain SLAs and certain governance rulings in place, um, which they measure, that's fine for me. Um, so, so what do we measure in, from from the moment it goes live? Is mostly seeing that certain identifiers are in there, um, making sure that it's interoperable, um, that uh, certain metadata is there. So every data set should have the the owner being uh, noted down within. The data catalog, whether uh, it sh it should include as a metadata whether the information um, uh, has personal information uh, for GDPR rulings. Um, so, so, so it's mostly about that that we're really quite strict. Whether it actually well describes the customer, that's the domain's responsibility. But as set, for example, it, it will be the only set. There's no other part in the organization building another customer view. So it's for, for, from, from that point of view, people will quite soon start complaining when the data set has rubbish in it. Um, but we cool. don't have a strict measurement there. And, and I think that the question might be a little bit more around um, each time you're, you're minting your, we just produced this data product you know, not like the actual product itself, but the each time you stamp that this is, you know, let's say it's it's minted every day, right? Okay, um, this thing has been created. How are you validating or how are you making sure that the, is that still just it's on the domain and there isn't necessarily a measure at the centralized level as to is what is actually available to be pulled the actual not the the data product structure but the the data within the data product is that 
Uh, no, is we, there any SLOs or how are you how are you kind of validating that as well? Yeah, uh, we, we have latency information. So when has the, the product last been updated? So there, there's quite a lot of batch jobs. Um, so, so then when was the last run uh, calculating the set? Um, as well as information for on real-time data sets, what's the throughput, the, the, the last moment in time. Um, so, so we have the information. We, we currently do not have a process to follow up on this. For example, um, within a data catalog, we will know down normally this set should arrive at 8 a.m. in the morning. Um, the timestamp says um, it, it does. It, it's a bit after eight, and it hasn't been updated. We we don't have alarms or automatic actions to start triggering those people yet. Okay, and and it sounds like what you're doing with the data catalog is you're not making the data product itself broadcast into the data catalog as to here's this you know. So anytime this stuff changes at the data catalog or at the data product level, you're you have to go in and manually change it in the data catalog. You're not like no, okay. that's that's automated uh, indeed. Okay. Oh, okay. Um, and then Chris had asked. I think this is a question that you know many, many, many people who want to implement data mesh have. Um, if if they don't necessarily have um, the buy-in as well, it's like, did you need to convince the business to get budget for data mesh? You know, were you brought in originally with this kind of concept in mind, or you know? Um, if you had to go and get budget or, or how, how have you convinced the, um, you know, kind of the holders of, of the, the money to let you have that to, to implement this? Yeah, but in that case, unfortunately for you, uh, my role was pretty easy. Um, I, I, th there wasn't a data area yet. So, so my I got brought in to shape this thing towards your vision. But we know throughout the organization, we already have up to 30 data engineers and, and a bunch of data scientists. So, so, so we're already spending quite a lot of budget. So, so make sure that we actually start doing something really well with it. Um, what does work, however, in, in convincing um, people that it's the right direction, even though we're already spending money, um, is when you start pointing to the quality of data. Um, to, to give an example, we have 40, 40 brands. Um, tracking data is quite important for us to know, uh, both for the use cases as I've described, but as well for just to know how our platforms are being used. Um, every platform itself measured items differently. Um, we couldn't compare video users with news users. A um, bunch of time there, there were quality issues or within the report we were lacking some kind of data. Making sure that you point to those failures as this is the issue I, I truly want to solve uh, is, is something which helped for a certain part of the organization. And, and for another part of the organization, it's pointing about the central bottleneck data team. Yes, we have a bunch of data engineers and 33 is not bad, um, but we need to support marketing and advertising. And um, currently we're quite stuff. Uh, dear CEO, CEO, please make a choice which one you think is most important. Th those are the questions that trigger people, uh, okay, as a, even as a company, I cannot make this choice. So why as a data leader within the company, I should make this choice where making sure that everyone gets enabled, make sure that the, the, that the question goes away. Yeah, so it sounds like you're, you're basically talking about, hey, like this is a real pain point um, and, and here's, here's a way that we might be able to solve it without having to necessarily hire a ton more people. There, there are, yeah. there's some questions around whether you, you know, to implement a data mesh, you have to go out and hire a bunch of people. And I think that's not necessarily answered. Um, I think, I think you, you were capable of doing it without, <laughs> without going yeah, out and hiring a ton. It, it's depending on what you already have in the organization. Yeah. If you currently don't have 
that much if you have, for example, two, two BI specialists and you have a, a 5,000 people company, then probably, yes, you need to spend some money. Um, <laughs> whereas in, in, in our case, we already have quite a large data lake team uh, still struggling with it, with a few things. We don't need to hire extra people. We, we need to start using them smart. Yeah. Um, so that's the main difference. Um, and, and Luca asked about, you know, domain teams, how are they feeling about having to become, you know, part-time data scientists? Are they happy with that extra responsibility? And, and I, I think if I could wrap in as well, you talked about you having people exit from your org, specifically reporting into you, and that you were happy to have that happen. Like, how, how have you dealt with kind of all of those different things of shifting responsibilities, adding new responsibilities to these domain teams? But also, like, how could people communicate that it can be a good thing to let their data engineers go into these domains and things like that? Just like in technology, uh, the, 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 the example we had on introducing Snowflake, uh, as well on the concept of data mesh, from an organizational point of view, we did a proof of concept. So we've, we've tried within two areas or domains, customer services, the subscription system and, and tracking. Um, we've tried just with those two domains, giving them data engineers focusing on, on certain points and um, letting them convince rest of the business. Uh, so for example, we had a brown bag session where we showed the results from, from uh, the customer service area where, where all people within the company knows it's a bottleneck team. They're building a new subscription system, yet every new product needs to be enabled to fire them as well. Um, and they stated, although we got other extra responsibility, we also got extra people, and it helps us even to enable use cases which we didn't think of. But by having a data product about subscriptions over all subscription systems we have, um, because we grow to acquisition, so we have five uh, subscription systems. Make sure that we can put an API on top of our data product, which was more for analytical purposes, serving it back out to our call centers. And now suddenly they have an overview when someone calls on, on all the subscriptions independently in which system it resides. Um, so, so it even helps us faster in certain items, although we got extra responsibility. And, and that's the story that started convincing other areas as well. Um, yes, we want to embrace the responsibility because we will also embrace the other people we get. Um, so, so that's the easy part. Um, then, then you have the large data engineering team, um, which was quite a... a team is having bureau clocks, uh, stuff like that. So, so they're, they're a close team. They suddenly get separated. For, for, for them, it was the harder thing because suddenly they're losing friends. They're going from their team um, to something completely different. Uh, but they as well say with, with the focus we currently have, um, that's really nice because before they were solving first an, an issue in airflow for the, the customer service department, then they needed to fix uh, a streaming job uh, here and then they could start work on the project they were working on. And then two weeks later, the, the organization says, well, we've chosen marketing, but now we should go to sales. Um, they're in a, in, in a constant focus switch. Well, now they have a clear responsibility. This is my domain. This is what I need to know. Uh, these products I need to maintain. And if they fail, I, I step in. But otherwise, uh, if something fails, I know who to address and, and who to solve it. Um, so, so that really helped them. And then keeping the community and making it a, a vivid group and a vivid team, even though they're hierarchically separated, um, uh, convinced them as well. Yeah, those kind of dotted lines of, yeah, you're, you're not necessarily reporting into this, but you're all kind of one group yeah. of people and you share knowledge. Um, it's really funny because uh, we've, this is literally our second meetup and um, both companies have said the first data product that they built has been to manage that there are subscriptions across multiple brands because nobody can see that because of all the silos on the domain side. It's, it's hilarious that that's the concept that, that if we just go into all of these things, we go, anybody who's got subscriptions, like data mesh, you just want to start here and you'll get hooked. Um, 
So, you know, I, I want to be uh, respectful of your time and stuff, because I know it's, it's quite late there. So, um, you know, cut, cut it off when, whenever. I've, I've got, you know, a, a couple more questions. Um, one was around, you know, you were talking about tool choices and how there were way too many. Um, you know, every uh, BI tool you could ever think of. You know, data mesh kind of doesn't have any prescriptive guidance around, you know, the domains get to choose, the domains get to choose. Um, yes, the BI specific side is, is also not necessarily the domain, you know, I guess the data domain or whatever, the, the BI people, but, you know, how do you manage that difference between um, allowing the domains to do what they need to do, but also not just make it so that there are 900 different systems and that you've got to, you know, manage all these custom integrations between all the different domains and things like that. Like how, how have you approached that? And, and do you have any hard guidelines or do you have any hard rules that, that you've kind of put in place to, to make sure that that's, you know, feasible? Yeah. Um, first thing we did, uh, as said, 2019 was centralizing everything to, to make this a more slender landscape. Um, so I do believe if you already start off with the, the spaghetti architecture and then move to the data mesh, it, it, it will only become more of a spaghetti or, or a data mess, whatever you would like to call it. Um, so so I, I do believe you need to start off quite simple. Also, when you're new, to start with one tool and then start uh, adding on top of it. What helps us is um, fr from one point of view, um, we'll offer that data platform, not a Swiss knife, um, yet tying up some components with a clear division of responsibility up until each other. Um, if you use our standard set, we stand truly really manage. Um, the click, the looker, the tableau, it's managed for you. If you want to use something else, fine, yet it's your responsibility. If it fails, it's your problem. Um, that's already one thing that helps. That then um, make sure that it's accessible. As, as said, we've introduced DataFi, so the, the Airflow, Spark, Scala, Python environment. Not everyone can, can, can work with that. I, I always tell I can write Python or Scala code, yet no, no one wants to put my code into production, and they're actually right. Um, and then I'm already further down the road than, than some others. So that's also why we were looking into DBT, stuff like that. Yet what is important in our setup, if it's a data product that should be reusable, then it should be in a, a software engineering CI, CD pipeline best practices flow. Um, so, so I don't believe in having local click templates which you copy and paste towards. Um, that's not the flow that we want to have as a as a setup where other people can uh, pick in. So it, if it's a product that has been reused by other prod, uh, by other people, it should be in a CI/CD wrapper. It, we should have a good governance on, on the process. We should have uh, should be able to roll back when something happens, uh, that kind of stuff. Uh, when it's more for actually your own purposes, and, and that's why that's mostly in the reporting side of things. If you want to use something else and you want to take the maintenance burden, okay, that's fine. But know that you also lose some kind of interoperability also. On a dashboard level, um, but but then it's your choice. Yeah, I think it's it's interesting from talking to many orgs that are are approaching this. You know, data mesh is that there's a lot more ability for people to choose, but there's also if you're thinking about things in a product way, that you have to serve things that meet you know your SLAs and your SLOs or whatever. If you've got if you think about what you're serving internally as that product, there, there's a little bit of a different approach to those tooling. So exactly what you talked about of like, you need to do it in, in an appropriate way, right? You need to make this so that, that it's scalable and, and, and you've got a responsibility now. Um, so there, there's one more in, in the chat and then, um, you know, I, I do want to let you go because I know it's, it's quite late, but um, I, I do also have a, a follow-up re request as to, um, you know, you, you, 
talked about how you move so fast if it, you know in all these different things if you've got like some time i know not right now because of the new kid but if you've got some time at some point to write something about how you can move that quickly i think that would be something that a lot of people would really love so um luke had asked in in the q a um he talked about growing access to data products to a wider audience in the organization. Um, I have a hard time thinking of the type of queries that a broader audience would need to run outside of an application. But you mentioned something in, in customer service. Do you have other use cases for a UI or SQL API? Um, not necessarily for a, for a SQL API, but for transformations towards uh, certain products. So to, to give an example, we have, we had a tool, uh, we're phasing it out, Smart Octo, um, which gives insights in um, consumer behavior on our platforms. So the, the article placed first on the home feed is currently being read so many times, the article being read on, uh, placed second so many, uh, the, the second one is being read more than the first one, hence you probably need to swap them. Um, or how is the comparison with uh, the current place with uh, with previous previous um, content placed on the same place? Uh, how is an article performing? Stuff like that. Um, there we give some standard insights, um, but we we want to give the audience as well. Um, the ability to pre-calculate stuff as well, because if you try to do that from a from a dashboard dashboard perspective, um, as it also needs some aggregates over time, it's it's quite heavy if you start uh, constantly demanding Snowflake and Snowflake scales really, really well. Um, so, so it will be able to handle, but my wallet won't be able to handle it as you're constantly using warehouses. So th so that's where you want to have. Um, pre-calculated views, materialized views as well. Um, and to be able to make sure they can build their own views on top of SQL, uh, on top of Snowflake, then you need to have the SQL interface as well. So that's where, where as well it pops in. Yeah. And well, and there's been a lot of conversations around how do you charge for data products and how do you, you know, do you charge the domain it owner itself because that doesn't seem fair because then you don't actually want people to consume but do you charge the consumer because you know that the part of their budget of whoever's consuming that data product then that becomes kind of an issue too because then you might limit consumption and and so you know there, there isn't an unlimited budget for all of these tools to be able to consume everything and stuff but it's 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 an interesting question if you you've got thoughts there great but or, or if you're just kind of in the same boat of everyone else going we're trying to figure it out that seems to be the, the standard answer um we're trying to figure it out yet um it should be arranged for budget session next year. So budget 2022 should be completely up until domains calculated and not, not upon the, the central data team. Um, where we're heading there is license wise, if, if it's regarding reporting tools, that's quite easy to calculate. Uh, processing power wise for your own data products um, we will put it in the domain product. So that does not mean that a consumer should be blamed. Um, it, it's not the data transfer cost, for example. It's really processing your, your set. And OK, then you can still say, as a customer service area, the concept of customer resides within my domain, but I don't have any specific needs. Why should I pay for this set? Well, well you're right, but that's the pain you'll need to take. Um, at least in our case, in the first case. Um, so that, that's a bit where we're heading. Um, that, that, however, means that um, you should be able to, to assign costs towards certain data products. And if you're living in a Kubernetes environment, um, already that is not that easy, uh, making sure that you tag everything correctly. So. Um, yeah. it, It'll be challenging, but you should invite me at the end of the year because I should have solved it before next year. Yeah, I, I managed AWS budgets for a, a public company and, and 
yeah, like that, even just Kubernetes of, and we just had this kind of mystery uh, set of services that were just oddly tagged. Nobody could really figure out what they were, but if we tried to shut them off, it broke everything. And it was like 6% of the compute. And we were just like, okay, that's just overhead. Um, so I, I, I do want to be cognizant. Somebody did just throw something in um, to the chat, but I, I do also, I don't want to keep you up too late. So do you got time for one more? Or? Give me the last one. Okay. Okay. This is, this is the last. Okay. Uh, so you, you haven't mentioned any output ports, you know, on your data uh, products. Um, have you made use of them or are you like, you know, how, how do you think about that? Is it all API or is it, you know, how, how do you enable the data analysts and things like that as well? Um, so to trying to under, understand the question. So it's it's really on how do you enable the data analysts within the company? So our output ports is, is the specific name that ThoughtWorks has given to how you can actually access a data product, right? So it could be that a data scientist, you know, it, you know, it could be, a data analyst just is able to export it to CSV or to put it into Looker or Tableau or Click, or, you know, um, but the data scientist wants the raw data. And so they're going to want it in a different way, you know, so they may want it via API. So like, what, you know, how are you making use of, of that concept of, of, you know, a data product needs to be able to be consumed by multiple different end users? Um. There's there there's two things. Um, it, it's a bit depending because we have data products where you want to have the real time version and the batch version at the same moment in time, and there's use cases building on top of them. Uh, think about, for example, the the, the clickstream data we have. Uh, you want to have it in real time for the insights which people are currently using the, the product, but you also want to have a batch calculation job on top of it because you have to have session aggregates because it gives you more information. Um, in, in that case, um, people should both be delivering a, a stream of set and for example, a dump, um, an hourly dump, something like that. Um, that's the only case where we ask the domain itself to deliver their product in, in two various ways. Um, next to that, everything should be registered in the data catalog and the access information should be in there. And, um, we're, we're going to write a wrapper around it that everyone has some kind of API access towards the data catalog, gets the specific information to extract the data. Um, and the wrapper itself transform it into the data access request. So if it's an S3 file, it, um, you as an end user send an API request to the data catalog, but directly read S3. Um, but the same thing can be that you directly read, uh, read a Kafka topic uh, and connect to it. Um, so that's how we, we're going to try to solve it. It's great color. And, and I think, you know, it's, it's a question that a lot of people are having of like, how do we actually make this so that people consume it? You know, what 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 is my user experience for the people that are actually trying to consume my data products? So, yeah, um, and and we're actually um, going to look into the fact whether we can can enforce it so that you don't have uh, access outside of the the API usage of the data catalog, making yeah. sure that we have the entire lineage overview as well. That'd be that, that's very interesting. I mean, uh, Intuit was talking about the same thing with. They're using Apache Atlas for their their catalog, and they're they're talking about how many you know different little things they've got to add to it, and, and all of that, right? It's 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 not an easy uh, problem. Uh, Jamak has said multiple times there's lots of tools that are still missing, and I think the catalog and the you know managing the the governance and access and all that stuff is is still so so difficult. So. Um, uh, again, thank you so much for, for this. This was an awesome overview. I'm probably going to end up stealing some of your slides for, for certain things. So, um, you know, but uh, thanks again so much. Um, and, you know, Juanis is, is in the Slack. So, um, you know, I don't want to say he'll just answer your questions or anything like that. But, you know, he, he's around and he's, he's provided a lot of great um, 
context and stuff around what they're doing in the past. So I do encourage uh, everybody to follow them on LinkedIn and, and do all of that as well. So um, really, really, uh, oh, uh, Okay, sorry. Uh, I, I, yeah, so um, following him on LinkedIn, is that, is that the best way that you want people to, to kind of? Yeah, okay. yeah link, LinkedIn or the, the Slack channel in the. Okay, sounds great. Well, thank you everyone. And uh, you know, we'll, we'll look to uh, have this up on, on YouTube as well relatively soon. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks everybody.